Good evening, and thank you very, very much, uh, Frank. That was very generous. When I hear introductions like that, I always want to ask the host if he needs more time. <laughs> uh, but I am delighted to be back with the uh, Baltimore Council. Uh, I remember very well uh, a wonderful occasion that I uh, spent with you 12 and a, about 12 years ago now, I guess, when I came here to speak about um, the earlier book that uh, Frank mentioned, The Myth of America's Decline. Uh, that, at that time, you may recall, we were, uh, this was before the end of the Cold War, before the demise of the Soviet Union, and everyone was worried about the decline of America's economic power and economic competitiveness. And the saying at the time, the slogan sort of at the time, was that the Cold War is over, or it's beginning to be over, and Japan has won. The notion being that we were now being very rapidly surpassed by other countries, in particular Japan, uh, because uh, we had been focused for too long on the Cold War conflict with the Soviet Union. Uh, and there was a real um, argument uh, popularized in the best-selling book uh, by a colleague at Yale University, Paul Kennedy, uh, called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Uh, predicting, in effect, that America would, in fact, take second place in the world to other powers, most importantly Japan and perhaps also Germany. Well, you know, predictions are difficult, and I don't want to hold anybody to their predictions, uh, especially, as uh, Yogi Berra would say, if they're about the future. Uh, but I will hold up my prediction at the time, which you can uh, um, infer from the title of my book, The Myth of America's Decline. I will hold that up. Uh, you know, with some pride today uh, against the other predictions because, as we have seen in the last 10 years, uh, the United States has become the preeminent power uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, not only economically, which everyone thought would not be possible, especially now that we had these very, very tough competitors in Europe and in Asia, uh, but also after the demise of the Soviet Union uh, in military uh, and strategic uh, affairs. And um, it, it's useful, I think, to at least ask the question, well, why was the one prediction maybe closer to the truth and the other prediction uh, was not? And what I want to suggest uh, tonight is that it has a lot to do with the way we think the world works. And that's a, a very important part of our thinking about specific issues. We all have a sense, whether it's explicit or not, we all have a sense of how we think the world works. I, on the basis of that, we look at then America's relationships with individual countries and uh, with specific issues, such as we uh, do today with respect to these issues of terrorism and proliferation. And so that's the first thing I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight. How do I think about the world? Uh, and why then do I view certain sets of relationships uh, that the United States has in the world today uh, in the way that I do and why I take the position ultimately that I do on specific issues. So I'm going to spend some time talking about how I th think about the world and urge you to think a little bit about how you think about the world. What's the model in your mind about how things work? Because I think everybody has to ultimately face that question. The protesters, those of us who maybe feel that maybe it's time now that we solve this problem uh, of Iraq by force if necessary, uh, we can't just uh, have a point of view. We have to sort of justify it in terms of how we think the world works and how our position, whatever it may be, no war or, yes, it's time for war, uh, we have to suggest how that's going to make things better, how that's going to move the world forward in a, in a direction uh, that we can argue will uh, be uh, an improved um, direction. The second thing I want to do is then talk to you about three sets of relationships that the United States has in the world today uh, based on the way in which I think the world works. And then in that context, finally, the third thing I want to do is address specifically the problems of terrorism and proliferation. How do we deal? Because those problems are embedded in one set of relationships that the United States has in the world today. Only one, by the way. Uh, in two other areas, we have pretty uh, good relationships, and um, I will explain that to try to put this problem of terrorism and proliferation in context. And then thirdly, of course, I'm going to tell you how I think and feel about uh, 
the uh, most importantly, I hope, how I think about the uh, current question of what should we do about the situation in Iraq and maybe also indirectly what we should do about the problem in North Korea and possibly also in Iran. I mean, it's very interesting. I know that President Bush was severely criticized for when he came into office for using this term axis of evil, and, 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 and there are many reasons to criticize him for that, but in some ways it was prescient. We now see that the three countries in the world that are in fact in the business of trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction are Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, and so um, I will talk a little bit about all of those, but most importantly about Iraq. Now, as I suggested, all of us have a view of how the world works. And so when we think about the problem of Iraq, for example, we come up with a different set of questions depending upon how we think the world works. Is Iraq just a matter of America's overweening power? Is it a consequence of the fact that America is so dominant that um, it's quite natural for countries to oppose us? Quite natural, first of all, for countries to think that we are the source of all the problems in the world in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. We're the source of the problems because we have so much power. And we're the source of the solution to those problems because we have so much power. Now, there are people, I suspect, who think about this question of Iraq almost exclusively in terms of power and in terms of the very unequal distribution of power that we have in the world today. France and its president has, has said as much on occasion. That is, it's not good to have a world in which one country has this much power. And we should therefore, uh, President Chirac has said, we should therefore have a multipolar world. And we should work towards that. And France sees itself as a leader in that effort to try to counter American power. Now, implicit in that question and in that approach to the problem of Iraq is a model of how the world works. Hegemony is no good. We need more balance. Uh, it doesn't matter, by the way, if the hegemon is a democracy or even a fellow democracy, because in some sense, you know, we're the oldest democracy, I suppose, in the West, and France is pretty close behind. Maybe, maybe Britain is, is, is um, you know, second in line, but um, even a fellow democracy should not have as much power as we have. That's what France is saying. So that's a view of the world that's based largely on uh, the distribution of power. Somehow or other, it's going to be better if we have a multipolar world, even if, by the way, some of the multipolar powers like Russia and China may not be democracies. A second way of thinking about Iraq reflects a different way of thinking about the world, is to, is to look at this problem uh, in terms of the role of international institutions, such as the United Nations, and to say that what's crucial about this issue is the basis on which we act, that we must abide by the requirements, the rules um, of international organizations, of universal international organizations, such as the United Nations, that they are the only institutions that have the right to convey legitimacy in terms of the use of force in international affairs. Now, again, there are a lot of people who think about this Iraq um, issue uh, in those terms. They think about the world working in terms of international organizations, much the way our domestic politics works, that is, in terms of centralized institutions, and the assumption being that only those centralized institutions, the U.S. government domestically or the U.N. internationally, have the right to decide when the use of force is legitimate. Now, there are a lot of Europeans in particular who believe this, many Americans who believe this, and who think about the world largely in terms of the development of institutions and the uh, legitimacy which international and particularly universal institutions convey. Uh, and there's a whole uh, way of thinking about the world that is embedded in that approach to the problem of Iraq. And finally, there are many people who think about the problem of Iraq primarily in terms of a clash of ideas, a clash about the purposes for which power should be used on behalf of a totalitarian society, on behalf of freedom and a democratic society, on behalf of a world of Islamic law, or on behalf of a world of Western law. Professor Sam Huntington, for example, at Harvard University is one individual who sees the current conflict with Iraq very much in these terms, in terms of a clash of civilizations. You may know about his book published in the 1990s, which drew a lot of um, uh, attention at that time and some criticism. Um, 
Um, but he portrayed the world in terms of a, and the way the world works, in terms of a clash of ideas. We're always competing over the basis on which we use power, the basis on which we organize power, and the basis on which we use it, and when it is legitimate to use it. Uh, and there are many people in the current debate who think about the world working that way. Uh, certainly, Islamic fundamentalists think about the world in that way. Maybe fundamentalists of all stripes think about the world in that way. Think about the world primarily uh, as a clash of ideas, a confrontation of good and evil. So these ways of approaching Iraq reflect sort of underlying thinking about how the world works. So let me say a word or two about how I think the world works. In my new book, I talk about two factors that are most, import in, uh, most important in thinking about the way the world works. Power and identity, or ideas. Now, institutions are going to pay, play a somewhat smaller role in my way of thinking about how the world works. Because they're, they're going to be largely a consequence of the way in which power and the way in which ideas are interrelated, organized and interrelated in the international system. Right? But this is my way of thinking about the world. Now, power is a fundamental aspect of how the world works. And the reason is that in the international system, power is decentralized. There is no world 911. There is no world 911 that we can call when we get into trouble. Um, no one in the world is recognized by all as having the kind of legitimacy that a national 911 has. You and I regard the government as being a legitimate, as, as being the institution that has the right to use force legitimately. So I'll say in a minute, you and I don't have that right. Uh, and of course, we acknowledge that the military, uh, that the police in our local communities have the right to use force ultimately against us. We don't have the right to use force against them, but they have the right to use force against us legitimately if we break any of the laws under which we live. So because there is no World 911, because there is no one that's acknowledged or recognized in the world as being legitimate to use force on our behalf, states have to defend themselves. And therefore, they have to arm uh, and they have to be concerned about their security. Now, that's been true ever since the beginning of the international system, certainly since the beginning of the modern period. Uh, and it creates what uh, we call in international affairs the problem of the security dilemma. That is, as one country then arms in order to try to defend and protect itself, uh, it may appear threatening to other countries. And as those countries arm, they may appear to be threatening to us. It's almost built into the situation, you see. That's why it's a dilemma. Because we can never be really sure whether they're arming to defend themselves or whether potentially they're arming to, in fact, do us some harm. Now, it doesn't mean that world, that kind of a world in which power is very important, doesn't mean that countries can't get along and that countries don't often negotiate and don't often agree and cooperate. They do. But it's interesting, they do so only when they feel safe. When they don't feel safe, for one reason or another, then you have problems getting people to negotiate. You have problems getting people to cooperate. And of course, in a world in which power is decentralized, there are going to be situations in which people are not going to feel safe. For example, most of the parties involved in the Middle East dispute today do not feel safe. Israelis don't feel safe. Palestinians don't feel safe. Uh, and in that kind of a situation, uh, you have a particular problem. Uh, in trying to bring people together, in trying to engender cooperation. But we have to ask a further question, it seems to me, if we're going to really understand more clearly how the world works, if I'm going to understand more clearly how the world works. And that question is, why is power, why is power decentralized in the international system? It's not in the domestic system, as I just mentioned. So why is power decentralized at the international level, but power is almost always centralized at the domestic level? And the reason, I argue in my book, has to do with identity. 
It has to do with the ideas, the rules, and the institutions by which countries organize and legitimate power. In domestic politics, we share a common identity. That is, we share a common consensus on the rules and the institutions that organize and can use power legitimately. In the United States, for example, our identity is expressed, indeed it's embedded, in our constitutional democratic system. This system prescribes how power will be organized and used legitimately in the United States. It sets up the institutions, it sets up the ground rules by which we make laws, and then by which we enforce those laws, and by which you and I accept those laws. Because basically we have acknowledged that only the government has the right to use force legitimately within our domestic system. This leads to the creation of a national 911, all right, that monopolizes the legitimate use of force. And it means that you and I, as individuals or as groups within this society, cannot use force legitimately. We can disagree about everything, as we will tonight, about Iraq and North Korea and lots of other problems. But we don't have the right to pick up a weapon or any means of force and use it against one another. The only institution that has the right to do that is our, our police forces and ultimately our national military forces. No one else has that right. We accept the monopolization of le the legitimate use of force by our government because we agree that the system is legitimate. We agree that the system, we accept the system. And as long as laws are made and enforced in, in, in accordance with this system, we accept the right of the US government and the right of our police forces to use force legitimately against us. Uh, the day we don't, the day large numbers of us don't, we cease being a country. We then collapse into or we then dissolve into civil war, as we of course have done in our history. Now, at the international level, we do not agree on how power should be organized, motivated, and legitimated. There is no shared common identity about the rules and institutions that determine whether and when force, the use of force, is legitimate. Because there is no common identity, there is no centralized power. Because no one recognizes anyone else as being the party that has the sole right to use force legitimately. That's one of the problems today. The United States has centralized power in the world. We're the dominant power in the world by far. More so, people argue, than has been true for any other country in history. And yet there are hundreds and thousands and millions of people who do not accept us as the, legitim as the source of legitimate, for the legitimate use of power. So there's no agreement at the international level. Even when a country monopolizes power, there's no agreement on the fact that that country is the only institution that has the right to use force legitimately. Now, so unlike domestic groups, you and me, inside a country, countries in the international system do not give up the right to use force legitimately. They do not cede that right to an international institution uh, and um, consider that international institution as the only institution um, capable of using force legitimately. And I think if you think about it, I could create a situation, even those of you who might believe that the United Nations is that legitimate institution, I could create situations in which certain countries lead the United Nations or make decisions on behalf of the United Nations, uh, such as Libya right now, who is chairing the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. And I will bet you I get unanimous agreement in this room that we will not consider the United Nations for the purposes of human rights uh, to be the legitimate, the only institution in the, in the world that can use force legitimately to enforce human rights. Now, <clears throat> it's true the UN, by the way, aspires to be that institution, and I think that's a good aspiration. And I think it's a good long-term long target for us to have in our foreign policy. But the fact is, we have to 
face some realities today, and, and, and uh, not only realities about power, but also realities about the legitimacy of the United Nations, and recognize that more than half of the countries that currently belong to the United Nations are countries or governments, for example, that we would not consider legitimate based on our standards. They've not been elected by their peoples. They are not accountable to their peoples. Uh, and as long as that is true, then you see there is a problem uh, for many people in terms of thinking about the United Nations as the sole institution in the international system that has the right to use force. Now I'll come back to that uh, uh, point in a minute when we talk in more detail about Iraq. Now if this is the way the world works, if the, way, the world works not only on the basis of power, but it also works on the basis of the extent to which people agree um, on the rules and institutions about when that power can be used legitimately. What does it mean for U.S. relationships with other countries in today's world? Now, here's where I get to my second point about U.S. relationships with various groups of countries. It means, of course, that when I now set, sit down to consider U.S. relations with other countries, I want to do that not just in terms of the distribution of power, but I want to do it also in terms of these countries' relative identities. I want to, in other words, take into account how similar or different the identities of other countries are compared to that of the United States. All right? Because if the ideas, if the identities on which other countries base the use of legitimate force are similar to ours, we look at similar rules and we have roughly similar institutions to make those kinds of decisions, then it's very likely that we're going to be less fearful of one another in our relationships and in our interests with one another in the world as a whole. We will understand how they legitimate the use of force domestically. They will understand how we legitimate the use of force domestically. And even though we're may, we may have different interests in the world because of different, different geographic locations and different economic uh, uh, resource capabilities, et cetera, nevertheless, we will be uh, probably much less fearful of one another in terms of the possibility that we might use force against each other in order to implement those interests, however different those interests may be. Now, if those identities, however, on which we legitimate force domestically are very, very different, are radically different from one another, then we're going to find ourselves in situations where countries are likely, our relationships are likely to contain a lot of fear about whether or in how that other country might use its force, <clears throat> might use force and consider it legitimate to use force. So when you think about U.S. foreign policy relations in this way, you come up with three big groups of countries with which the United States relates today. First group of countries are those where America's liberal democratic political identity converges with the identity of other nations. And here I'm thinking about U.S. relations with the major democracies around the world. The, the seven major democracies, all right, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, U.S., and Japan, the so-called group of seven. But then more broadly also, most of the countries of the OECD, of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, uh, some 25 or 24, 25 countries, all of, mostly in Europe, all right, but now also in uh, other places in Asia, like for example South Korea, uh, that have developed either strong democracies or they're on the verge of developing very, very strong democracies. All right, countries that transfer power peacefully from opposing parties under general conditions that allow for real competition and real opposition uh, inside those political systems. Now, that, that's a very broad group of countries, by the way, and a very important group of countries, and it's a very different aspect of today's world than any world we've lived in, at least in the history of our republic. And so it's, it's terribly important, it, it, and it's one of the reasons why I'm troubled so today about the quarrels that are going on in that world, all right, especially between the United States, for example, and France and Germany. All right, but that's one set of, and, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that those quarrels aren't nearly as bad as they seem to be, because um, my expectation is that these countries uh, ought to be able to work more closely together than any other countries in the world. 
all right, because they do have this relatively similar sense of how to organize and legitimate power and when it is and under what rules you use that power, both domestically and ultimately also internationally. Now there's a second group of countries that we relate to whose identities strongly diverge from ours. That is, they base their use of force domestically and possibly also internationally on very different rules and institutions than we do. Take, for example, a country like fundamentalist Iran. It organizes and legitimates power domestically in that country on the basis of Shari, on the basis of Islamic law. We live in a country where it is absolutely prohibited to enforce public laws on the basis of a of religious law, the law of any religion. Now, these two countries organized in this very different way, leave aside all other factors, how powerful they may be, et cetera, or where they're located, they're going to have trouble understanding each other. They're going to be somewhat fearful of each other. They're going to have more difficulties relating to one another than two countries that, in fact, base their use of power on similar uh, rules and standards. So we have our biggest problem in international relationships, in relationships with these countries. And by the way, not only we, but all other countries as well. This is an, I'm doing this analysis from the standpoint of US foreign policy relations, but you could do it from the standpoint of the foreign policy relations of any country. When you are in relationships with other countries where your identities, your national identities sharply diverge, you're going to have much more greater difficulties. There's going to be much more fear in those relationships. And, and here's where we encounter our most serious problems today. We encounter our, the problem of terrorism, right, which is not associated directly, global terrorism, which is not associated directly with any given state, all right, but involves a group of very committed people who have a very different set of ideas and a very different set of identities. I'm talking about the fundamentalists now that are part of the Al-Qaeda network uh, and institution, you could argue, in the system. Um, we have big problems, obviously, with their interests and their objectives. Right? Second group of countries that we have problems with in this category, of course, are the rogue states. States that we think may be inclined to aid global terrorism in one way or another. And most, of course, seriously, by ultimately providing global terrorists with access, or at least facilitating access, to the technology and to the uh, instruments of weapons of mass destruction. Now, the third, there's a third set of countries in this second group, and that is authoritarian countries or totalitarian countries. That lots of other countries, like Libya, for example, or even Egypt, countries that aren't in any way. Um, supporting global terrorism or suspected of supporting global terrorism are not in the process of acquiring weapons of mass destruction, uh, but countries that um, base their domestic systems on very different standards than we do. Now, many of these countries are moderate countries that we have good relationships with. They're often our allies in many circumstances. Uh, but still, the fact that we have very different national identities uh, makes things more difficult than it does with those countries where we have strongly converging identities. All right, finally, a third set of countries that we relate to. And these are countries whose identities are in transition. In transition toward more openness, towards more accountability. In other words, in transition towards national identities that are at least approaching, coming in the direction of our domestic identities, our democratic domestic identities. There are two big countries, obviously, that are very important in this group of countries, and that's China and Russia. All right? Two big countries that aren't yet by any means democratic. I mean, I will argue that point without any difficulty, I think. Um, but which have taken some big steps the last decade or two decades um, towards opening up their societies. China, economically, Russia, politically actually more than economically, even though under Putin uh, they may be taking some steps backwards. Uh, but these countries are in transition. And so um, there are many countries, by the way, other countries in this, in this category. For example, Mexico, a country which is in transition, all right, from a one-party system, basically an authoritarian system, to a more democratic system. Uh, 
Um, we have seen some countries like South Korea and Taiwan, I should call Taiwan an entity, but you know what I mean, uh, who have uh, come a long way in, in this transition and may now be classified, if not as strong democracies, then certainly emerging democracies. Um, now, let me talk about the, uh, briefly about these three sets of relationships and most importantly about that second set where we have our problems with terrorism and with proliferation. Uh, in the first set of relationships, uh, this is America's relationships with the other major democracies. This is, these relationships are really quite unprecedented. We've never had a situation in the world where all the major industrial powers have had the same domestic rules for organizing and legitimating force. Uh, that's never happened uh, in the entire 500 years that we've been worried about, uh, you know, international politics uh, um, um, since roughly the beginning of the modern age. Um, it has led um, to a lot of studies that have first established statistically that these countries do not seem to threaten to use force against one another, let alone ever actually use force against one another, the so-called democratic peace. We don't know, understand all the reasons why this is the case, but factually it is the case that these countries have not ever in any circumstances threatened to use force against each other, all right, as a means of settling their disputes with each other. So in some sense, these countries already enjoy the equivalent of a dom common domestic identity. They don't consider it legitimate to use force against one another, just like you and I domestically do not consider it legitimate for us to use force against one another uh, when we disagree about issues. Now. Um, This fact is hard, for me at least, to sort of ignore. Despite the fact that I know we have major disputes with these countries, economic disputes in particular, and that's what I worked on for the most part in the first couple of decades of my career, um, and these were sometimes very, very bitter disputes, and of course these are the countries with which we have major disputes today about Iraq. But I firmly believe that we have seen no evidence yet that these countries have indicated or given any in any sense that they would in fact use force. I mean, there is potentially the chance that if one of these countries, for example, a France uh, or a United States, if we if were to be, a, the situation were to be reversed, if France were to actually, when we're engaged in a situation of combat with another country, if France were ever to actually provide military assistance to that country, that could be a point on which you see the democratic peace could crumble. That could be a point on which the democratic peace could fall apart. I don't see any evidence of that, despite the bitterness, in particular, of this issue uh, that we currently have with Iraq. And so I'm still encouraged by the fact that this is a strong base for the operation of American foreign policy. We should try to always work with these countries. And we should, we should not do things in the world unless we can persuade a majority, not all, but a majority of these countries to come along with us. Now that's the same principle on which we operate domestically. We don't believe that it's legitimate for our government to use force unless a majority of the people approve it. And what I'm saying is that within this world of democratic nations, we should never, the United States should never use force unless it can persuade a majority of those countries to support it. If we can't, then we have to ask ourselves the question, have we made the case? Because all of these countries make their decisions based on open, free, debate and decision, just like we do. Now, um, I didn't say that we wouldn't have quarrels with these countries and that we wouldn't have to act aggressively sometimes toward these countries, diplomatically that is. Uh, we may not have to act unilaterally in some instances as George Bush has done, for example, in this dispute over Iraq. Because if you're going to get 10, 15, 20 major democratic countries to agree, you're gonna have to put some, you're gonna have to exert some leverage. Think about how hard it is to get agreement and consensus inside the United States. If you're now working, even if you're working with other democracies, if you're now working with 10 or 15, it's gonna be very hard. You're gonna to have to use all the leverage you have at your disposal. And so the United States is gonna to have to act as, other, as we might expect other, country, other democracies to act pretty aggressively from time to time. And notice I did not say that we um, should only act if we have the authority of the United Nations. All right, because as I suggested before, there are too many countries
that are members of the United Nations who do not base the decision on when and whether it's legitimate to use force on the free debate and determination of their people. Now let me uh, turn to the second group of countries and more specifically to the uh, question of Iraq. I want to talk about uh, those countries uh, first in terms of the um, terrorists of global reach, uh, then in terms of the so-called rogue states, and then finally the um, authoritarian states who are nevertheless very different than we are. And, 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 and I'm thinking here mostly about Muslim countries, about moderate Muslim countries who nevertheless have very different standards domestically for organizing uh, power in their societies. First, terrorists of global reach. Um, the, we're at war with terrorists of global reach. It's just that simple. Um, they attack the United States in a major, major way. The largest loss of life on American territory ever. Six, seven hundred more dead than happened in the case of Pearl Harbor. So against that network of global terrorists, we're at war. And we have to win that war. Um, we have to win that war, just like any other war that we have been engaged in. Uh, we need to do it. Um, uh, we did do it, by the way. We did do it very effectively in uh, dealing with the Taliban, the Taliban government in Afghanistan. The first rogue state, by the way, that was clearly supporting and abetting terrorism and where all of the hijackers or most of the hijackers had been trained, et cetera, uh, in um, the se September 11th hijackers had been trained in those camps. We mobilized a coalition of not only the democratic countries, but also, for the most part, the United Nations. Uh, and we uh, destroyed that Taliban government. And now we're struggling, obviously, to try to uh, establish some kind of a stable uh, government in Afghanistan, some kind of a stable situation in Afghanistan. I think we're making progress. I don't think we should expect too much. Uh, and, but I think we can uh, hope to continue to do what we're doing and slowly maybe expand the zone of stability in that country, uh, eventually sort of broadening out from Kabul. But it's a lot better. The situation here is a lot better than it was before September 11th. Now we have turned, now we've con we con we're continuing to go after terrorists of global reach. And there's a whole war going on there. And there are all kinds of questions. I'm not going to go into those about how we're waging that war. It's a very hard war because we're going after you know, people who aren't identified with a state or with an army. Uh, and so we're having to use lots of intelligence and lots of you know, interception and lots of um, uh, means for tracking people and trying to find out more about people that come very close to some of our most important rights. And therefore, many uh, Americans are disturbed by this, and I think rightly so. We should, be, we should be alert. But we should also be aware of the fact that we're fighting a very unusual enemy here of sleeper cells all over the place. We don't know how long they've been there. We don't know what their plans are. Uh, and so we may have to make some concessions uh, towards, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, with respect to those rights that we hold to be most cherished, uh, that we cherish the most. But we should be very, very careful. And we should have a good debate about that. And there are plenty of reasons, I think, to uh, be concerned about that. But now the question has come. And by the way, I think we're making progress in that war. That was evident you know, just a couple of weeks ago when we picked up one of the top echelon of the Al-Qaeda leadership and maybe now are on to the trail of Osama bin Laden. But it's not over when we get Os Osama bin Laden. It's not over. I mean, there's still lots of sleeper cells and lots of other uh, layers of leadership out there that we're going to have to deal with. But now we've turned our attention to, to rogue states. And we've done that for one major reason. And that is these states are the ones that are able, might be able, to provide terrorists of global reach with weapons of mass destruction. And now we are looking at the possibility of not a September 11th attack, uh, but a Hiroshima. We're looking at the possibility of some kind of a major catastrophe in an American or a European or a Japanese or a city anywhere in the world. Now, as I mentioned before, I think in some sense I give Bush quite a bit of credit for uh, identifying this problem fairly early on. I don't think he created it. I don't think by calling something the axis of evil, all of a sudden we make the world into an axis of evil. This is where you know, uh, I think people exaggerate uh, us as the source of the, all the problems in the world. But he, you know, and he maybe used the, word long, the, the, the wrong language, but he did say, look, watch those countries. 
they don't have our interests at heart. And indeed, today, now, those three countries are at work. Why is Iraq, though, why is Iraq the major concern for us? Why aren't we doing, you know, why is, aren't, we, aren't we attacking North Korea? They've got, probably, a couple of nuclear weapons. Uh, or even Iran, which may be further along. It's, you know, we don't know. I mean, the case of, seems to be further along because we know more about the Iranian program. Uh, you know, than Iraq is. Why is Iraq such a problem? Well, let me, let me suggest, uh, you know, a number of reasons why I think Iraq is a unique problem. Uh, and let me do this by, address, by addressing a number of questions. First, is it an immediate threat? And I'm going to suggest, because that's a premise for war. People say, well, look, it's got to be an immediate threat. Otherwise, you know, war is a pretty uh, big step to take. And I would argue for five reasons, it is an immediate threat. And you have to take all of these five reasons together, because any one or two of these reasons, other countries may be doing things similar. But Iraq's the only one who's doing them all, or the, Iraq's the only one uh, for, for, for which all five of these factors are in play. First, it supports terrorism within its region. It has been doing that. Aggressively, it still does that. It supports terrorism in the Middle East. Secondly, terrorists of global reach come largely out of the Middle East. They don't come out of North Asia, Northeast Asia. Uh, they come out of the Middle East. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers, as we know, out of Saudi Arabia. This has been the seedbed for the growth of the terrorists of global reach with whom we are at war. Third, Iraq is clearly out to get weapons of mass destruction. It has used them, and there is no question about the fact, it almost had them, by the way, prior to the 1991 uh, war. It was only about six months away from a nuclear weapon, even after, by the way, the IAEA. They do the best job they can, but look, they don't have a lot of leverage, even after they had declared that Iraq was nowhere near a nuclear weapon six months before that war occurred, and we went in and we found out they were only six months away from a nuclear weapon. So they are clearly, I don't think, in my mind at least, there's no doubt about the fact that they're trying to gain weapons of mass destruction. Fourth, Iraq has invaded its neighbors in the last couple of decades, has taken the initiative to attack its neighbors. Now, those decisions may have been rational. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, it was rational for Iraq to attack Iran and for Iraq to try to see if it could take Kuwait. Um, but they were awfully risky awfully risky decisions, and they, of course, proved to be, you know, bad decisions. He lost both wars. So here's a man who takes big risks. People say, oh, well, he would never take a risk on which his survival depended. He took risks in the last couple of decades on which his survival depended. He could have lost both of those wars. He could have been displaced in 1991. Many people think we should have displaced him in 1991. He took the risk of losing power. Uh, he thrives, I think, he survives on risk. He doesn't survive by avoiding risk. Fifth and finally, Iraq exists in the most troubled and unstable part of the world. North Korea does not. Iran does. Uh, but Iran is, and Iran's doing quite a number of these things, uh, but it hasn't invaded its neighbors, uh, as Iraq has. But Iraq exists in the most unstable part of the world, uh, where many countries in that part of the world would like for Iraq to acquire weapons of mass destruction. I have the sense that most countries in Asia don't want North Korea to acquire weapons of mass destruction, right? They still don't quite know what to do about it. They haven't agreed on what to do about it, but they really, there's nobody there who's urging them on. There are groups in the Middle East that are urging Iraq on. Now, for all of those reasons, Iraq, I think, is unique, all right? Plus the fact that we are focused on Iraq. We've been focused on Iraq, or we haven't been focused, that's, but we've been dealing with Iraq for 12 years. 17 UN resolutions. It's now time to bring this thing to a head and to a conclusion in the case of Iraq. Now, secondly, you could argue, um, uh, secondly, is war the only way to deal with this situation? All right? Because that's the second important question we have to address. As, as President Bush has said, and as I believe, and I think everybody in this room probably believes, war is a last resort. There's nobody who really ever wants to go to war, except perhaps a despot, a dictator. Uh, but I suspect most people, maybe even a despot and a dictator, although it's hard to 
uh, to know in, in this case, in the case of Saddam Hussein, um, once more. Um, but we've tried just about everything else with Saddam Hussein. We've tried just about everything else. We've been at it for a very, very long time. Inspections exist today in Iraq only because there is a credible threat of war, only because there is a credible threat of war. They would not exist at this moment if there was not that credible threat of war. How long can we sustain that credible threat of war? At some point, that credible threat of war becomes a bluff. You can't contain Iraq through inspections forever. You cannot do it. As soon as it becomes clear that, you, that those inspections are no longer backed up by force, and that will become clear after a certain period of time, uh, then Iraq will simply go right back to its tricks of the, la of the past 12 years. So containment through inspections, I think, is not a long-run alternative. It's a short-run alternative, but it's not a long-run alternative. At some point, the threat to use force is seen as a bluff, and Saddam Hussein is uh, back in the game. So war, in the end, has got to happen if Saddam Hussein does not disarm. He makes the choice, ultimately, as to whether or not there has to be war. If he disarms, even at this late date, if he trots out all these weapons, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that, in fact, he would continue to survive. We would not replace that regime. If, however, he doesn't, he's decided that the only way that Iraq can be disarmed is through regime change. So there isn't a real distinction in my mind between disarming Saddam Hussein and regime change. They come together and Saddam Hussein is the critical link. Third, is war if it happens legitimate? Aren't we acting alone? Aren't we acting unilaterally? Aren't we just being the, the bullies? Um, aren't we just saying power makes right? Um, my answer to all of those is no. Um, we have threatened to act unilaterally, and Bush has done that, I think, very convincingly, because he has wanted from the beginning to try to get the largest multilateral group together for this action possible. And the only way you get people to move towards consensus is to make them believe that, in fact, you're going to act on your own if they don't move towards consensus. Now, your threat has to be credible, and Bush was very good at that, so good that I think he has most of us fooled and most of the media fooled. That is where we're saying, oh, no, no, he doesn't want multilateral action. He just wants unilateral action. Look at what he's done. I mean, he's gone to the UN. He got a unanimous approval in the UN for uh, Resolution 1441. He went to the US people. By the way, in an election, I know some people thought that was unfair. I thought it was very appropriate, because that's the moment when you can hold your congressmen accountable. That's the moment when you can hold your representatives accountable. So to have this decision made during the election period as it was last fall, I thought was, it, it reinforced the representativeness of our system. And he got two-thirds of the U.S. Senate, two-thirds, I mean, three-quarters of the U.S. Senate, two-thirds of the U.S. House behind him. And to this day, uh, 55, 60 percent of Americans, according to the latest polls, still support this war, even if we ultimately have to act without uh, the United Nations. Now, uh, Bush has also never acted unilaterally. We've always had the British there. They've always been there. Um, you know, amazingly so. I mean, they, they have been a, a real stand-up ally in this whole business, uh, despite the enormous political cost for Blair at, at home. Um, and um, I don't think we will act and ultimately go to war without a majority of support from the democratic countries. As I suggested, I think that's the benchmark that we have to meet, and I'm convinced that that's the benchmark that, uh, that Bush will meet. And that will make the action legitimate. Fourth and finally, is the war the worst alternative, as the president of France, Jacques Chirac, likes to say? No, it is not. And Jacques Chirac should know better. He should know the history of his own part of the world. War in 1938 would not have, was not the worst alternative. The worst alternative became war in 1941. War in 1938 would have been a much, much less destructive war. There are times when war is not the worst alternative. Inaction is not going to come cost free. Inaction will mean that Saddam Hussein will get nuclear weapons. Iran will get nuclear weapons. 
it means that the Middle East conflict is now going to be splintered by a ghastly nuclear divide. You're going to have an Iran, you're going to have a Pakistan and India in the middle of the Middle East, the most unstable part of the world. Uh, you're going to have um, um, potentially other disastrous terrorist acts. And as I say, the most, you know, possibly the worst of all, that is some weapon of mass destruction going off in an American city or a European city. So inaction has costs and kills no less than action. I happen to think that action now, if necessary in the next few weeks, um, may not be the worst alternative and might actually bring better consequences in the Middle East than what we could expect without the war or uh, what we have today. You have to recall that it was only after the first Persian Gulf War, only after the first Persian Gulf War, that we got the first serious peace negotiations in the Middle East conflict. It was only after that war in 1991 that the Israelis and the Arabs finally got down to talking about peace. Didn't work, didn't work, but it was certainly one of the most helpful, uh, one of the most hopeful periods uh, in the entire history of that long conflict. And my guess is that we'll be able to get those that process going again in a much more uh, effective and poten potentially productive way uh, in the wake of a war. Now, all of that assumes, of course, that the war goes well, is short, relatively you know, costless. All of these things, I realize, are risks. Nothing is certain in war, but I'm trying to suggest to you that war is not always the worst alternative, as uh, some people have uh, suggested. All right. Quickly, uh, to wind up, let you uh, get involved in this. What about North Korea, though? Isn't it an even bigger threat? Shouldn't we be doing something about North Korea as well? Well, I think we will in time. Uh, but I also give the administration high marks for setting priorities. Uh, and North Korea, to me, suggests what's going to happen down the line with Iraq. It suggests to me how much more difficult it's going to be to deal with this problem of Iraq after Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. And so in my case, it, in my way of thinking about the world, it reinforces the need to do something about Iraq now and then turn our attention to North Korea. I think the basis for a solution in North Korea is um, more promising than in uh, Iraq for all the reasons I suggested. The countries in that part of the world all have a stake and do not want North Korea to get nuclear weapons, most importantly China, because that will mean then ultimately that Japan has either draws closer to the American nuclear umbrella or gets its own nuclear weapons neither of which is a very happy alternative from the standpoint of the Chinese. And so I think we will have a better chance of uh, capping that problem. But it will have to be done multilaterally, by the way, in, 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 in Asia. We can't do it again uh, like we did in 1994 unilaterally and, 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 and fail, because the 94 agreement uh, has clearly failed. Now, it, to, to, to draw it together, I've, how does this then relate to what, what, what the war then is a possibility, as I've suggested, what kind of an impact will it have on other states with whom our identity diverges, i.e., these moderate authoritarian states around the world? Well, my hope is that it will create, as I suggested, uh, new opportunities in the Middle East and the Middle East peace negotiations, that it will give these countries more time to think about their relationship to the world system and particularly to the world economy. Because for many of these authoritarian and especially Muslim countries around the world, they haven't yet made the decision, the fundamental decision to modernize. They haven't made that decision domestically for all kinds of reasons, all right? political as well as perhaps religious. Um, my hope is that we can, we'll have a new opportunity to work with those countries, especially in the context of the Doha round of trade negotiations, which for the first time, the ninth round of major trade negotiations since World War II, which for the first time is going to focus on products that these countries produce, textiles, agriculture, tropical uh, uh, agricultural products, et cetera. Um, and that uh, potentially in the next five or 10 years, we might have a movement in the world economic system that would create openings for those countries until they develop, until they modernize and figure out how to square their faith with modernization. Uh, they're going to have great difficulties and we're going to continue to have problems with them. So what I'm trying to do is buy some time and space uh, to create another chance for them to rethink that problem. But the more important reason that I um, support very strongly 
a world economic system that is open and free and that steadily works towards liberalizing trade, especially in products for developing countries, is because I think that's going to help those countries in transition, those third, that third group of countries that I talked about, more than anything else that we can do. It will also help China and Russia more than anything else we can do to potentially liberalize their own domestic societies, initially economically, and then we hope, although we have no guarantee, that that will lead to greater openness politically. But we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity in the world beyond this problem in Iraq. We have an opportunity to really uh, engage those countries, create a stake for them, have them create a stake for themselves in the world economy that will ultimately, ultimately make them status quo powers and ultimately produce down the line a much better world than we have probably ever known. Not only a world in which there are uh, a lot of major democracies that are close friends of ours, but also a world in which those two big powers, whom I really don't believe will ever become democracies in the same sense that we are, but nevertheless will be much more open and accountable and responsible and transparent and will therefore be much less fearful and much less threatening in their relationships with us. So that's where I come out. Uh, America or any other country is not just concerned about preserving its power. We're also concerned about the rules and the institutions that organize and legitimate that power. That is the way, as I've tried to suggest, I think about the world and how it works. The first task of our country and of any country, of course, is to defend itself. The United States was attacked. We have retaliated. That's the war against global terrorism. I've given my reasons for believing that we now have to address the problem of rogue states. Uh, but lastly, uh, our second task is to build a better world by trying to narrow national differences and to try to do that through the biggest instrument we have at our disposal, even bigger, I think, than our military power, which is ultimately our open society and our open market. And that will help a country, for example, like Pakistan, all right, which makes a lot of textiles and wants to ship those textiles to the United States. That'll give Pakistan the best chance it will ever have uh, to ultimately work its way through this dilemma of how to reconcile modernization with its faith. Thank you.